I want to say something just before we get started. I have not known too very much about Islam. I do not say that with any type of pride, but I have to be honest. In the last few months, I have studied Islam somewhat, and I'll admit I've only scratched the surface. Back some, I guess it must have been about two years ago now, I made a derogatory statement over television about the Quran. If you were not listening that particular week, I'm never going to tell you what it was. I wonder if it's ever been explained how many passages in the Quran, and it, it is a beautiful book. Literarily, it's unequal. But how many stories were plagiarized from Jewish fables and folklore? I wonder. And he said he prayed in the name of Mohammed come out of him. I ask him, what happened? Nothing. He prayed several times in the name of Mohammed, come out of it. But I remind you as I close this, a dead man cannot produce miracles. cannot produce miracles. Jesus Christ is alive. I want to look for a moment at the alleged contradictions or variations found in the Word of God. And from this, I want to prove to you that this is the Word. In 2 Samuel 24 and 4 and 1 Chronicles 21 and 1, it mentions that God provoked David, 2 Samuel, Satan provoked David, 1 Chronicles. It seems like a contradiction. Of course, anyone that studies the Word of God knows that God is said to do things oftentimes that He only allows to be done. To be honest with you, there's evidence in the Quran that the same thing was done by God. I want to say that again. There's no contradiction here. God oftentimes, in the Old Testament especially, is placed in a position of being responsible for something when He only allows it to be done. And in reality, He is responsible, in effect, when you think of that. In an explanation about the contradictions in the Bible, whether Satan provoked David or the Lord provoked David, he said, look, this is, we attribute it to God. That though the devil did it, we say God did it. On that basis, would we be prepared to concede that God had those six million Jews incinerated because Hitler did it? We say because God intended it, this is what he wanted to do. So God is responsible for the massacre or the incineration of six million Jews. Or even 600,000, or even 6,000 is dramatic enough. If, they, if Hitler did it, could he say God did it? Are you going to blame God for that? You're going to exonerate Hitler and the Nazi party because they said God did it? No, dear brother Swagat, we don't think like that. If a criminal does such and such a thing, we say it is his action, he's responsible. We don't say God did it. Because usually the power comes from God, but God has given you that free will to think and, and to see right from wrong. So if you do wrong, you are responsible. You can't hold God responsible. So either David was provoked by the Satan or by the Lord. And Satan and Lord are not synonymous terms in any religion. They are opposites. Satan and the God Almighty are opposite things. 
In 1 Kings 4 and 26, it speaks of 40,000 stalls, Solomon's grandeur. 2 Chronicles 9 25, 4,000 stalls re relating the same incident, and we would have to think, isn't that a contradiction? It is. Plain, pure, and simple. It relates the same story. There are several incidents in the Word of God stating the same identical thing in various different ways where one account will be given and the number will be slightly changed. Another account will be given, it'll say 2,000, and then Second Chronicles or First Chronicles 3,000 or whatever. In any book claiming to be from God, that book will be free from contradictions. Like, for example, the example the brother gave, I repeat that, I said, look, it says in one of the books, Solomon had 4,000 stalls of horses. Another one says he had 40,000 stalls of horses. And 4 in 40 is only the difference of a zero. So you say, I said, you know, my cousins, the Jews, they didn't know the zero when they wrote the book. They didn't know. It's my Arab brothers who found it from my fathers in India and they shared it with the world, zero. The Jews didn't know. They wrote this in words. Four, F-O-U-R, four. In Hebrew, of course. Forty, F-O-R-T-Y, forty. I said, now who made the mistake? God or the writer? And they were not saved. We are told that they were not saved from mistakes. Mrs. Ellen G. White, you say she's a cultist, Mrs. Ellen G. White, the prophetess of the Seventh-day Adventist movement, She says in her Bible commentary, I have the book here. In her Bible commentary, she says, she has no motives to lie. She believes in the Bible to be the inspired word of God. And yet she says, so the Bible we have re we read today is the work of many copyists who have in most instances done the work with marvelous accuracy. In most instances, she, they have done their work with marvelous accuracy. But copies have not been infallible. And God, most, mo, and God most evidently has not seen fit to preserve them altogether from error. God didn't see fit. In other words, this is, this is his business, God's business. If he wants to see fit, if he wants to do a thing, he does it. If he doesn't, he says, look, go to hell. That's your business. So God didn't see fit to preserve them from making errors. In transcribing, in the following pages of her commentary, Mrs. White testifies further, I saw that God had specially guarded the Bible. God had specially guarded the Bible. I am asking for what? Yet, when copies of it were few, learned men had in some instances changed the words in the original manuscripts. They changed the words, thinking that they were making it plain, when in reality they were mystifying that which was plain by causing it to lean to the established views which were governed by tradition, like the Jehovah's Witnesses. They have produced a translation called the New World Translation. The Orthodox, you don't accept that. Why don't you? Because they have their own leanings. According to their own ideas, they are changing the words. Same thing that the Protestants did. They were people who believed in Jesus as God, so they said now, they changed the words. So we said this is, has been going on from the very beginning. We believe that Moses wrote what is called the Pentateuch, those first five books with the exception possibly of the last few verses in Deuteronomy. And he could have even written that because we believe that God, and I know Islam believes, that God is so powerful that he could have revealed to Moses exactly how he would die and exactly how that his funeral would be conducted. That would have been no problem for God. But whether he wrote it or whether Joshua wrote it, it was written about 3,500 years ago. The first five books supposed to be the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These revisers, scholars of the highest eminence, they are telling us today that 
Moses didn't write the books. He didn't write the books. He's not the author. It's the author, Genesis. Author, the first book of Moses in inverted commas. Exodus, second book of Moses in inverted commas. Leviticus, third book of Moses in inverted commas. Numbers, fourth book of Moses in inverted commas. Deuteronomy, fifth book of Moses in inverted commas. I'm asking why the inverted commas? What for? Why this inverted commas? They are telling you in a very, very diplomatic, psychological way that these are not our words, we don't believe so, but the common man, the laity, the preachers, the Bible thumpers, the hot gospelers, this is what they believe. That these are the books of Moses, but Moses didn't write them. We don't believe that these are his words, so we put them in inverted commas. It's not the book of Moses. There are more than 700 times in these five books. You read the expression, and the Lord said unto Moses, and Moses said unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Moses, and Moses said unto the Lord. Neither the Lord said this, nor did Moses write it. English, this is your language. This is written in the third person. Not by God, not by Moses. If Moses wrote it, you would have said, The Lord said unto me, and I said unto the Lord. The Lord, I, or the Lord says, I said unto Moses, and Moses said unto me. This is in the third person, and that somebody else is writing about these things. It is not the word of God, it is not even the words of Moses. With regards to the obituary, I found out from Jewish scholars, that Jewish prophets didn't write the obituaries. You know, before dying, he says, you know, on my tombstone, you put these words, epitaphs. Jewish didn't, didn't do that. In the book of Deuteronomy, it says, my brother admits that it could be the works of Joshua. But they're supposed to be the books of Moses. How does Joshua fit in? He says, and there Moses died in the land of Moab. Died in the past tense over against Beth Peer, and no man knew what of his sepulchre unto this day. And Moses was, he was, a hundred and twenty years old when he died. Now, some mention about the many versions of the Bible. Really that's an incorrect statement. There is only one version of the Bible. There are many translations. Our scholars argue constantly over varied translations. King James Version, as we use that term, as I've mentioned incorrectly, is really a translation. Others have been put out. They were critical of the King James. Even to the point of laboring incessantly to derive the Old Testament from the Hebrew in which it was written, minus a few verses in Aramaic, and the New Testament in Greek. Translations, some are incorrect, we think. I personally like the King James. And Brother Swagat, has given us to understand that translations and versions are one and the same thing. We Muslims, we have a number of translations of the Quran even into the English language. Different people, Yusuf Ali, Mamidu Pikthol, you know, Darya Badi, and so on and on. We have English translations by different people. And there the translation means a difference in the choice of words. Choice of words in translating a certain phrase from Arabic into English. Choice of words. Versions are quite a different thing. Look, here, I have in my hand this Bible, which Brother Swagat, as well as many Protestants, do not accept as the Word of God. This is the Roman Catholic version of the Bible, the Douay or Reims version of the Bible. This Bible has 73 books. This is an encyclopedia of 73 books, seven more than one 
or which Brother Swagat takes oath on, the King James Version. This is the King James Version. He takes oath by it. In his Evangelist magazine, December 1985, somebody questions Brother Swagat about the Bible being the Word of God. And he says, Word of God, and in bracket, I refer to the King James Version. In your Evangelist of December 85, the King James Version. The King James Version has thrown out those seven extra books. Thrown out. In other words, those seven extra books, the, Christ, the Protestants do not accept as the Word of God. You use certain technical terms like, like apocrypha, which the masses of Christendom do not know. What is this apocrypha? Apocrypha means doubtful, weak, not deserve to be in the book of God. As such, the Protestants threw it out as a fabrication. These seven books are thrown out from here. So this version, the Christian Protestants will not accept as the word of God. Am I correct? This is not the word of God. So we put it aside. I agree with you. What you tell me, I accept. You say, it's not the word of God. I say, I agree with you and I put it aside. Now you tell me that this is the word of God. The King James Version. With his 66 books. This was first published in 1611. By order of His Majesty King James. Whose name is still based today. Authorized version, authorized by who? Not God Almighty, by King James. He authorized it. Not God Almighty. There are some 24,000 manuscripts of the Word of God, of the New Testament alone, I should say, that dates back before 350 A.D. The original statement or signature or autograph of the Word of God does not exist. As I mentioned, the first one was printed on vellum or, or clay tablets some 3,500 years ago. They perished from overuse and from being put on material that had little lasting quality, at least not that long. But at any rate, some 24,000 copies have been made. And scholarship tells us when it concerns the ancient books of antiquity, if at least 10 copies are in existence, you don't have to have the original to guarantee the original. And when one considers that there are 24,000 copies and there are some variants in those copies, we admit. But basically the text is not changed. The boast about 24,000 manuscripts. Brother Swagat, you know no two are identical. Your scholars say out of the 24,000 that you are boasting about, no two are identical then how do you come to know that this is the word of God and this is not, out of the 24,000? On the very face of it, when you open the book, the Injil and the Torah you're talking about, it says Mark, and um, Matthew begins, in your version, the King James Version, it says, the gospel according to Saint Matthew, the gospel according to Saint Mark, the gospel according to Saint Luke, the gospel according to Saint John. I'm asking, what is this according, according, according? What is this according to? Why according to? I have got Brother Swagat's book. It says, you know, homosexuality, its cause and its cure by Jimmy Swagat or just Jimmy Swagat. It doesn't say according to Jimmy Swagat. Why this in the book of God? According to, according to, according to, according to. You know why? Because Matthew didn't sign his name, Luke didn't sign his name, John didn't sign, Mark didn't sign his name, John didn't sign his name. These are assumed anonymous books. Anonymous books attributed to God. In the genealogy, in Matthew and Luke, in Matthew it gives Joseph's genealogy, and in Luke it gives Mary's genealogy. In the 
the, the temple in Jerusalem. If there had been anything wrong with... I'm running out of time. <laughs> okay. If there had been anything wrong with the genealogy of Christ, they would have pointed it out immediately, but they did not. The genealogy between Matthew and Luke we are given 66 fathers and grandfathers to Jesus. In a genealogy of 66 fathers and grandfathers, except for one name, no two names are identical. Separate list, everyone is a different name. Brother Swaggart says, one is the genealogy of Mary and one of Jesus. I say, why of Mary? Does the book say that? No. The book says this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The other one ends with Jesus Christ. There's no Mary inside. 66 names, no two are alike except one. And the father of Jesus Christ, allegedly, God Almighty, he is not there. Can you imagine? God Almighty dictating the genealogy of his son in inverted commas. And yet he leaves himself out. He is going out of his way to dictate two genealogies with 66 names and he is not in it. He is not there. I am asking what is he trying to tell you? What is he really trying to tell you when his name is not there? A man who had no genealogy, we believe. No genealogy. He was born miraculously, without any male intervention. You give him 66 fathers and grandfathers, and you say, this is God Almighty dictated. We Muslims, Brother Swagat, we take strong exception to this type of handling of this mighty messenger of God. The Judah, the father of the Jewish race, from whom we get the word Judah, from whom we get the word Judaism, that he had prohibited with his daughter-in-law by the roadside while he was on his way to Timnath. He sees this woman sitting by the wayside and you know he goes up to her and he says, allow me to come in and to thee. She said, what will thou give me? And he said, I'll give you a kid from the flock. So what guarantee that I will give it? He said, I'll give, he says, what, what guarantee do you want? He says, your signet and your bracelet and your staff. And the old man gave it to her and he prohibited with his daughter-in-law and began twins, Fares and Sar. And they are put now in the genealogy of Jesus. That they are the great, these children of incest are the great grandfathers of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. It says, and this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David, and Abraham being an Isaac, and Isaac became Jacob, and Jacob became Judas and his brother, and Judas became Fares and Zara of Tamar. Who are these? Look at the cross reference. It tells you Genesis chapter 38 and you find that this is the father-in-law prohibiting with his daughter-in-law who is the children of incest and they are honored to become the great grandfathers of Jesus Christ. I want to know how does this come into the book of God? How does this come into the genealogy of a man who had no genealogy? in his ascension. I give you the ascension. Brother Swaggart quotes in his book, Mark chapter 16, verse 16, another place, Mark chapter 16, verse 19. I say, it's not in my Bible. I didn't print this. The Jews didn't print it. The Hindus didn't print it. You Christians, you produced this book and you're telling me that this is the most Today, Bible going to the most ancient manuscripts. So I look up for Ma Mark chapter 16. I see it ends at verse 8. 9 to 20 is missing. Did I take it out? The Muslims took it out? No. 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 covering de denominations, they thought it fit that this is another fabrication imposed upon Christendom. And they also threw it out. It's not in my Bible. Therefore, it is not the word of God. If this is the word of God, then that is not the word of God. But, I pick up another Bible. Look at this. Look at these two. Brother Swaga, I didn't pick it. Look at that. I see back again. It's inside. What was thrown out? The ascension. There are only two places in, in the Gospels. In the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, there are only two places where ascension is mentioned. 
Mark chapter 16, verse 19. Luke chapter 24, verse 51. Thrown out of this bush. Thrown out. As fabrication. Essential. And yet these Bibles, each and every one of them, they tell us that Jesus, when he went to Jerusalem, he rode the donkey into Jerusalem, Matthew says. Mark says he rode the donkey into Jerusalem. Luke says he rode the donkey into Jerusalem. John says he rode the donkey into Jerusalem. So God Almighty didn't miss that out. His son riding the donkey into Jerusalem. When every Tom, Dick and Harry was riding donkeys into Jerusalem. That he didn't forget. But the ascension is not mentioned not once. And where it is mentioned is now thrown out. But I buy another Bible, identical Bible. That's to the look. Printed by the same printers. I look and it's there again. What was thrown out, they put it back again. How come? How come? What games are you people playing? Look at this. Back again. This is the 1971 version. Back again. The ordinary people, poor people, they don't know what's going on. What game is being played? Who knows? You read the preface. The learned man, the preacher, he reads the preface, but he won't tell his congregation what he's reading in the preface. In the preface we are told that individuals and two church denominations, they stampeded them, they forced them that they should put it back. If not, they're going to preach against this book to say, look, don't buy this, buy the King James Version. Don't buy this, buy the King James, the most up-to-date Bible going to the most ancient manuscripts. No, 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 don't touch that. This is the safer one, because it has everything that you want to preach, to catch the fish. It's easier to catch the fish with this than with this, the bait. You know, the fish, you know, uses, like Dale Carnegie, he tells us in his book, how to, uh, says, how to win friends and influence people. He says, I like strawberry and cream, I think most Americans do. But he says, when I go fishing, I put a worm, worm to catch the fish. It's not that I love worms, but this is what the fish loves, so I put worm. So now, if you want to catch fish, you've got to use the right bait. Ascension is now restored to the text, says the preface. Why not God told them so? God doesn't speak freely to those scholars, as freely as he happens to speak, as brother claims, with him. And I want to start this out tonight by quoting a passage of scripture that Mr. Dedot and myself disagree somewhat over, but which is one of, if not the dearest passage in the Word of God to the world of Christendom, found in St. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only unique son. Who'd you there, Mr. Dedot? <laughs> his only unique son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life and I want to use that as the basis for this simple statement that I would attempt to make tonight now prepare for the shock I said prepare for the shock from these 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations. They say, yet the King James Version has grave defects. And that these defects are so many and so serious. They are, these are not my words. They are so, they are so many and so serious as to call for revision in the English translation. Call for revision in the revised text. And in the revision, the kingpin of the evangelist, the preacher, the hot gospeler, the Bible thumper, John 3.16. No Christian preacher is worth the name if he can't clinch the deal with John 3.16. John 3.16. For God so loved the world, in the authorized King James Version, that he gave his only begotten son. My brother Swag, I've changed the word begotten to unique. This is not from the King James Version. The King James Version says begotten. I heard Brother Swag on TV. 
or was it video? This morning, this morning, there he's speaking to a group as if it was his own church group, you know, giving some lessons on baby long, I think it was on that or another one. He used the word begotten this morning. And in eight hours time, he changed it to unique. <laughs> I'm asking, are you ashamed of the word begotten? Are you ashamed of it? That Jesus is the only begotten son? We believe the Word of God teaches that there is one God, not 2, 5, 10, 12, 15, one God, manifest in three persons, three different personalities. We believe there is a Heavenly Father, we believe there is God the Son, and we believe the Holy Ghost, as Mr. D. Dot mentioned, that came upon Mary, is also God. They are indivisible meaning they agree perfectly. They are one in unity. They never disagree. They never have disagreed. You see, the idea of the Holy Ghost in Christendom is that he is one in a trinity. But the Christian says that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. But they are not three gods, but one God. In his catechism, he continues that the Father is Almighty, the Son is Almighty, and the Holy Ghost is Almighty. But there are not three Almighties, but one Almighty. It continues, your catechism. It says the Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person. That's what Brother Swagger says in his book. Person, person, person. But not three person, but one person. I am asking what language are you speaking? I'm asking, is that English? By God, it is gibberish, it's not English. You see, you say person, 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 but not three person, but one person. I say, Brother Swagat, you and your two other brothers, let's say you are three identical triplets, and we can't make the difference out between the three of you. They're all identical. We can't make out the difference. If one of you commit murder, can we hang the other? You say no. I'm asking why not? So you tell me that he's a different person. I said, right. What makes him different? His personality. So the father, you know, imagination, the human mind, you can't help. When you use words, they conjure up mental pictures. When you say in the name of the father, you have a certain mental picture of that old father Christmas, Santa Claus, millions and millions of times bigger than man, but something like a man sitting on some planet with his feet dangling onto the earth as his footstool, the heaven as his canopy, the loving father in heaven. When you say God the Son, I'm asking, are you thinking of a prize bull or a false one? No. You're thinking of a handsome young man, blonde hair, blue eyes, handsome features. Something like what you saw in the King of Kings, Jesus of Nazareth, you know, uh, on the day of Prime, where Jeffrey Hunter was acting, you know, handsome young man, blonde hair, blue eyes, handsome features, nice beard, not with a poly nose, with a crooked nose, that might make other pictures come into your mind, you know, Shakespeare made Shylock famous, is it Shylock, Shylock, no. You see, so you're thinking of somebody like an Englishman, or a Nordic, or a German type, with a straight nose, the sun. And the Holy Ghost, something that came like a dove when Jesus was baptized in the river Jordan by John the Baptist, or something that came in flames of fire at Pentecost. I said, the picture is not very vivid, but the picture is there. You have three distinct mental pictures. And however hard you try, you can never superimpose those three pictures and create one. There will ever be three in your mind. But when I ask you how many pictures you see, you say one, you are lying to me. Brothers and sisters, you are lying to me. in the name of Mohammed come out of him I ask you what happened nothing he prayed several times in the name of Mohammed come out of it nothing and I do not mean that disrespectfully of Mohammed he could have prayed in the name of Abraham or Moses. 
and it would have done no better. He could have prayed in the name of Paul or Peter and it would have done no better. So standing there alone, he says, I think I'll try it. My Christian friend has said it. I don't believe it, but I'm going to try it. He laid hands on him. In the name of Jesus Christ, come out of him. He said, Brother Swaggart, before my eyes, he was delivered by the power of Almighty God. I know that you do not deny the miracles of Jesus. But I remind you, as I close this, a dead man cannot produce miracles. With 2,000 years of preaching, look at it. You have these powers of miracle working. Christ gives life. He heals the sick. Muhammad couldn't. In the name of Muhammad, they couldn't do it. I said, my brothers, you don't read the scriptures. Jesus Christ, he said, for they shall arise many false Christs and false prophets who will show you great signs and wonders if it were possible to deceive the very elect. If false Christ can do that, if false Christ can perform miracles, if false prophets can perform miracles, then I said, is this a test of your faith? No. Then Jesus Christ tells those who are doing this miraculous work, He's telling you in the Gospel of St. Matthew that on that day, on the last day, on the day of judgment, he says, many will come to me on that day saying, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name do many mighty works? In your name, in the name of Jesus, didn't you do all these things? Didn't we do all that? He said, yes. He said, then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I said, here, explain. You. He won't tell the Jews, depart from me, put sack, get away, I don't know you. He won't tell the Hindus, get away from me, or the atheists, get away from me. He will tell you. I want to know why. Why would he tell you? I don't even know you, get out. I says, look, these are not the text. John the Baptist, according to Jesus, one of the mightiest messengers of God. Jesus says, among those born of women, there has not risen another greater than John the Baptist. And yet he performed no miracles. Did he? Show me, what did he do? What miracles? No, miracle is not a test. But the greater miracle is that without any miracles you transform nations. Nations are transformed. One thousand million people, they don't imbibe alcohol because of the dictates of Muhammad. I've learned that Muslims are some of the most hospitable people on the face of the earth. And I've learned that you are extremely, totally dedicated and serious about your faith. In other words, it's not just a sham with you, you mean business. Jesus said, by the fruits you shall know them. Do men gather figs from the thistle or grapes from the thorn? He said, every good tree will be a good fruit and every evil tree will be evil fruit. Here is the test. He said, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. One day very soon, you see, he's promised to come back. He's coming. Because he said he would come. Every single prophecy in this book that is supposed to be fulfilled has been fulfilled. The others that have not yet been fulfilled will be fulfilled. There is a hunger in the heart of every person for God. Only Jesus Christ can fill that hunger. You see, Jesus Christ, when he sent out his disciples on the mission of preaching and healing, he instructed them, he said, Go ye not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. But go ye rather unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
I want to know will the American Anglo-Saxons fit in as the Jew, the house of Israel. Then he's telling a Jewish woman, a Greek woman comes to him wanting her daughter to be healed. So he turns his face away. She goes on the other side and she won't let him go. So the disciples say, help her, this woman is persistent. You know, like a drowning man clutching a straw, drowning women do the same. Heal her child. So Jesus says, I am not sent back unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the Jews. So they say, help her. Jesus says, do not throw the bread of the children to the dogs. Who are the dogs? The Gentiles, you and me. Every other human being other than the Jews are dogs and pigs. According to Jesus or according to your scripture. It says, Jesus says, do not throw that which is holy into dogs. Do not throw pearls before swine, lest they turn and rend you. Who are the dogs and who are the swine? The Gentiles. So he says, do not throw the bread of the children to the dogs. The woman in desperation, her child's life is at stake. She says, Lord, Master, even the dogs have crumbs from the Master's table. So he said, give her the crumbs. So this is the scripture. Unfortunately, the scripture is not being quoted. The scripture quotes what Jesus said. I'd like to hear what Jesus said. Jesus says, not about this supposed idea that you just believe and you say, he said, verily, verily, I say unto you, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. There's no heaven for you unless you are better than the Jew. And I'm asking, how can you better than the Jew by not keeping the laws and the commandments? You answer that. There is no book on the face of the earth that has had the textual criticism that this book has had. I, I sort of feel insignificant when I stand here attempting to speak about the Bible when I realize that some of the world's most eminent scholars have critically looked at every single text over and over and over again, sparing no expense, no time, no effort to ascertain if it was what it said it was. I have read the Bible through many, many, many times. And others such as I have read it many more times, much more educated than I could ever be, understanding both Hebrew and Greek. And the 32 scholars of the highest eminence backed by 50 cooperating denominations, they threw it out. To appease us. Did the Muslims threaten you that look if you don't take that word out of the Bible, we won't supply you oil? Did they do that? The Arabs? Did they tell you no oil if you don't take this word out from the Bible? Why did you take it out? Because it was an interpolation. It was not the word of God. The Bible you are carrying, it has this interpolation. And you said this morning I heard the tape, you said one word. Even one word, it says if it is not supposed to be there, it's there, it says the whole book should be thrown away. Whole book! But it's not only one word. There are chunks and chunks of it, according to your revivals. And Brother Swagger tells me in one of his books, that if you want to know anything factual, knowledge, on any subject, you go to the experts. And he gives an example that if you want to know something about geology, you go to the geologist. If you want to know about the Bible, where do you go? To the barber, shoemaker? No, you go to the Bible experts, the Bible scholars, and they are telling you that this is a fabrication. Then, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Brother Swagat also quotes Ed Verbeckin from the first episode of John, chapter 5, verse 7, where it says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. If he gives me time, he says, Now look, which book? I can open it and show it to you. Which book? Edward Batten, his quotation. I said, Look, but it's not in my Bible. Is this not the Word of God? In my Bible, it's not there. Why is it not there? Because your scholars 
32 scholars of the highest eminent Bible scholars, backed by 50 cooperating denominations, they say this is a, another fabrication, another interpolation. So they also threw it out without any ceremony. In response to Brother Swagat, Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the Bible. In response to Brother Swagat last night, at question time, somebody posed a question to him, where he was asked whether there was any mention of Muhammad وسلم, in the Christian Bible. And Brother Swagat, according to his understanding, knowledge, he said, no, there is nothing in the Bible about Muhammad. In the world today, there are some 1,200 million Christians and a thousand million Muslims, and they are at loggerheads on the subject of the revealed scriptures. The Christian, he says that the Bible, the Holy Bible is the word of God, and they will not accept another. And the Muslim says that the Quran is Allah's kalam, is the word of God. Homosexuality, he says what it has done, he's staying in his book on homosexuality. You know, this filthy, dirty thing you call gays, sodomites, you call them gays. He says, America, he says it's time that God would judge you. If he doesn't judge you, he says he might have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And I will prove from the Christian Bible, not from the Quran. The Quran says they didn't kill him and they didn't crucify him. We are satisfied. But no, to satisfy the Christian, I will show to them from the Christian Bible that brothers, you have misunderstood the whole thing. You are reading something and actually you are misunderstanding it. Doctor, Doctor Sahib, I says, please tell us, tell these people that in my language, in English, when we say a spirit has no flesh and bones, that it has flesh and bones. Tell them. You're ready for this. Oh, yeah. okay. I want to be sure he's ready for this. But... All right. All right. <laughs> Shadow Allah, 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 Allah.